Good morning, Academy. My name is Tato Sarani Matala from South Africa, a Soweton girl raised and a daughter from a teacher in a township school, uh, Mukhame High School. I have an honor to welcome our guest today, Dr. Pumzilem Lambo Mnuka, a former deputy president of South Africa from 2005 till 2008, the first woman to hold this position. Ms. Mlambo Mnuka uh, attended the University of Lesotho in 1980, where she obtained a BA in Social Science and Education. She's, she finished an, uh, an MA in Education Planning and Management in the year 2000 at the University of Cape Town. Between 1994 and 2005, she held key position in the uh, Ministerial uh, Cabinet of uh, South Africa. Since she left the cabinet, she's been an inspiration to people who aim to develop Africa through education, people like I and you sitting down there. Mr. Mlamo Mnuka is about to complete a PhD uh, at the University of Warwick in the UK. Her research is on technology and teacher's education. It resonates with efforts to improve on the quality of education of the 21st century. Enough about what she used to do and see what she does now. As part of an ALA community, she's been around us and helping us also to, to develop Africa, and she's been a handful in doing that. Ms. Pumzilem Lamamnuka is the founder and chair of Umlambo Foundation, which deals with education and leadership development from school principals. She's a member of Global Leaders Council, a trustee of Global Fund for Women, a founder and chairperson of Mdiza Finance, a trustee at Mandela Rhodes Foundation on Education. Ladies and gentlemen, Please help me welcome Ms. Pumzilem Lambamnuka. Thank you very much, uh, Tato, for your kind introduction. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for this uh, invitation to the leadership of the Academy, and congratulations for this uh, wonderful initiative, institution, and a dream that I think is coming true every day. Well done. Uh, I also would like to congratulate and welcome the participants uh, who are participating in the seminar on, on, on poverty. Welcome people from different parts of the world and hope that uh, it's truly been a, an experience to be in South Africa, and I hope that uh, it's been both work and play, because there's a lot to see for those who may be coming to South Africa for the first time. We together are living in the 21st uh, century, which is uh, synonymous with unprecedented change, by and large driven by technology. I sometimes think that the changes that we see that technology uh, is in particular, uh, information communication technology is driving this day. The only other thing that uh, uh, parallels it is electricity, the discovery of electricity and the extent to which it has an impact in all our lives. So we have a truly uh, a time of our lives where we can be architect of our, of our destiny, but at the same time, if we are unable to collaborate and to envision the change that we want to see, all of these changes that are happening uh, that we are supposed to be part of could be just an event that we are watching in pain, in poverty. It doesn't follow that because we're living in this century that has got so much to offer, we necessarily benefit from the change. And I think it is in gathering like this that we reposition ourselves, not only to change our own lives, but to facilitate the change that will impact on other people's lives who have lesser possibility to make it happen for themselves. We're living in this 21st century world that is networked with explosion of information, not necessarily knowledge all the time. Sometimes it is just information, sometimes it is information that we're better not even getting. But nevertheless, it is all around us, and it is how we then turn around that opportunity 
to be something that is uh, meaningful. With all of these changes that we're seeing in our lives, in our time, there's the big anticlimax of poverty. Not just poverty, also extreme poverty. And it is not, we, we are not seeing this poverty in the world because there's only just limited resources. In fact, that probably is less of an issue. It's the inability to share the resources that we have in such a way that more people have a reasonable quality of life. And we know that restructuring society in such a way that there's a better sharing of the resources of the earth is something that needs geniuses like you. It needs leadership, it needs dedication, it needs commitment. And as we would say when you go to church, you go there to revive yourself about the things that are possible, the things that you could do. It is in situations like this that, and I'm sure in the last few days, we've had lots of ideas about some of the things that we should be doing as young people, as leaders, as professionals, to actually make the world better. I want to talk about some of the critical drivers that either decrease or increase poverty in my book. And there are three that I would like to touch on. Education, gender inequalities, and leadership. To me, those three stand out as critical uh, drivers of, of change that contributes or robs us or, or, or that contributes towards poverty or decrease it. The lack of quality of education for the poor is a main uh, contributor to poverty. Because as you can imagine, in countries and situations where the majority of ordinary people have a decent quality of education, they have a fighting chance for their future. It doesn't uh, answer all the problems. It is not a pan pan panacea, but it is a major platform on which the majority of citizens in any country are able to fend for themselves. Gender inequalities, where you live a little bit more than half of the citizens of any country, in a level of subjugation, you actually create inequalities and you rob that nation of the energy and the contribution of those people just because of their gender, which when harnessed properly makes a dynamic contribution to, to a sustainable future in any society. And of course, poor leadership across all sectors. Poor leadership in politics, poor leadership in business, poor leadership in civil society, poor leadership amongst young people, poor leadership amongst women, poor leadership in sports, all across the board. I think we have a degree of a crisis of leadership in our world. I know we have it in South Africa, we have it in different countries, we have it in different uh, sectors. Starting with education, I want to highlight the fact that when I talk about a uh, poverty uh, a reduction, my definition is ab about, is a uh, looks at how in every generation you decrease the number of people who are poor, not so much the level of poverty within a household. We have spoken a lot about poverty alleviation, which always used to worry me even when I was in office, even as we were giving grants, that we, social grants that we give to South Africa to, to the very poor people, that what we managed to do there is to make poor people less poor. But we leave them in a perpetual state of poverty because they will all, it's a yo yoing situation because the possibility to slip into their poverty is always there because it is not taking them sustainably out of poverty and therefore reducing overall in a population the number of people who are poor so that as those people who have been taken out of poverty, they will be able to make the people at least in their family in the next generation unpoor. Am I uh, saying this well? Because the difference between the, the, the importance of a family in this instance is that if in each family we manage to 
turn around the fortunes of that family in such a way that they are decidedly unpoor. They take the responsibility to make the next generation in their own family to be better. And then it sort of takes care of itself. Some of us are here because someone in our families went to school, got education, and decided that in my family, my children will go to school and will make something of themselves. And that one decided about their children. And therefore, the chain and the cycle of poverty is broken. The take is that the biggest uh, intervention that we need is to find as many families as possible where we create those conditions. Much better, that is much more sustainable than many of the things that we do in trying to reduce and to address the issue of poverty. It becomes a bit more sustainable when we are able to empower each family to, to, to have what I used to call a turnaround strategist of a family that will make sure that that family is unpoor. So part of your responsibility, I suppose, that's those of us who are here, and I, I would imagine many of you would come from families uh, who are not necessarily rich, you have that obligation to go back and make sure that you sustain the chain of making the next generation and the next generation in your family and poor. The challenge is to just get as many people who are in that position to do that. And education is the best way to do that, actually. It provides that opportunity for as many people as possible. We also um, have seen how globally there has been a discourse about addressing poverty led by the United Nations. I'm sure you would have spoken about the Millennium Development Goals in the last few days. And combining Millennium Development Goals with the Education for All, we normally refer to that as the inter internationally agreed goals. Those two, go those two campaigns, the Millennium Development Goal and the Education for All, uh, have two goals that are common to both of them. It's universal access to education and gender parity in schools. And again, those are the two goals that most countries who have been very active in, in this campaign worked on. And it is not surprising because they are seen as pillars of addressing the issue of poverty. The problem with those two goals has been that it's been a focus on quantity, not on quality. So most countries in the world have been able to send, especially the ones that were starting at a very low base, many children to school and achieving universal access to primary education, including South Africa. But achieving universal access to primary education, where you almost have 100% of your, of your uh, young people that are of a school going age at school, does not necessarily mean that because they are at school, they are learning. It does not mean because they, they are at school, automatically they will get the, the kind of education that will make their lives better. So the second push that we have in addressing the issue of poverty through education is making sure that with universal access of education, it is universal access of quality education for the poor. In fact, some researchers argue that poor educations make the poorer poor because they get trapped in a neither no state. There's also counter arguments that says that every year in education makes your life a little bit better. I'm still trying to understand which one of the two, but I know that education makes it different and I know that quality education is priceless. And I think that probably suffices to hopefully uh, be a message that I'd like to, to pass to you. So as we sit here coming from different countries, you probably will come from a country, if you are from a, in, in, in any way in Africa, where there has been this unprecedented uh, uh, increase of enrollment but we don't have enough teachers to teach these large numbers of children that have come to school, and that is where we are facing a crisis. That therefore makes the teacher a critical role player in the value chain of the fight against poverty. And sometimes teachers are not even aware that they are so critical for making the world work or not work. And that is why for me, that is the most important job in the world. And I know that we don't always look at it like that. I, I know that we don't uh, uh, reward it in, 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 in that manner. But I also know that it is a job of people who have capacity to sacrifice. And you'll get your reward in heaven, teachers. <laughs> 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 
it remains the most important job. I think that teachers hold half of, teachers and women hold half of the sky. If those two constituencies can drop the sky, we're all gone. To me, it is as simple as all that. So students, be good to your teachers. Um, we also want to emphasize education because in Africa, the majority of our people are young. We are the youngest continent in the world, which is a competitive advantage, but also a potential milestone around our neck if we don't do the right things. It is also not a static advantage that we'll always have. It is a passing window of opportunity because as people get older, we use this unique moment of being a young person, full of possibilities, full of dreams, and with less baggage than older people like me. And therefore, we can invest in you something that will make you a, a much more dynamic citizen of the future. Having a young population, as we have in Africa, represents a possibility for a democratic dividend, as, as they call it, which comes with effective execution of investment of, uh, in education plus related services which together become the game changer. We have seen that in some countries in Southeast Asia who invested in the 60s in primary education, especially quality primary education. As a result, as that generation grew older, they created the Asian Tigers. And in, through that process, education in those, I mean, a poverty in those countries was sustainably and substantially reduced, and they were where they are today. It was investment in young people, taking advantage of a democratic dividend, and creating a platform that is taking them from generation to generation of a better quality of, of life. When I think that in the 1960s, Ghana was richer than South Korea, look at us now. It is amazing. And the main difference there, leadership, education, I don't think that uh, both countries were strong on, on gender, but they, I think they could have been an equalizer. But education and leadership made a big difference for South Korea to be where they are today. With, um, leadership, with, with, you, with young people also, an important component that makes the, the, the democratic dividend a reality is youth activism. If as a young person you are not an activist, and I'm, I just don't, I don't mean being necessarily politically active, there are just so many things that you need to be attending to and doing something about, because there is so much work to do in Africa. No one has the luxury to be inactive, inactive. Being active is about what you do in sports, what you do in, in, the, in, 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 in health, what you do with, with old people, what you do with children. Every young person needs a cause to bleed for. I think it is sinful when you are young and you are not part of making something of yourself and making something better in, in, in the community that you live in. Your community could be your school, could be the neighborhood that you live in, it could be your connection of friends. So if your life as a young person is to get up, go to school, do your books, go home, eat, sleep, I think that actually is not being young. Young people, you, have got, you need to have other interests and you need to dedicate your energy to making other people's lives better. That makes you such an infinitely better person. And of course, because people here are interested in leadership, that will definitely make you a better leader. There is no doubt about that. That is one of the schools of activism, is the school of leadership that prepares you for many challenges that you grow up to face as you become a leader later on in life. Uh, we, so I said that uh, education, therefore, is a critical uh, change maker in how we decrease or increase poverty. Teachers, I said, were a critical uh, role player that uh, their position in the value chain of processes that make our societies better is a unique uh, position. Without them, we wouldn't be able 
to create the kind of world that we'd like to create for the numbers of people that we need to create. Then leadership. Leadership across the board, whether even, and I'm talking also even about leading yourself because we're all leaders. You are not a leader because you're standing in front of a platform and you've got a title and an office at the corner. You are just a leader because of the content of what you do. And the most important thing for me in the leadership that we need that is missing in many of our, of, of our countries is integrity. So as young people who are being trained to be leaders, embrace integrity. And you cannot buy integrity you earn it, you live it. It makes you a predictable person. It makes people know what you stand for. So with integrity, uh, and, and, and with many people of integrity in our countries, in different institutions, we get to have a collective and a critical mass of people who can work together to make our countries better. It's very rare that people of integrity will not focus on the fight against poverty. These kinds of qualities, uh, this kind of quality leads itself to wanting, to people to wanting to do the right thing for, for, for the citizens. A good leader with integrity, in my view, loves humanity more than they love themselves, which is not a difficult thing to do, actually, once you give yourself um, into it. Because being worthy of the, of the title of, of, of the leader, has to be something that we constantly address. Um, if I am elected here as your leader in this community, and because of show of hands, the fact that X number of people showed their hands and chose me does not give me the content to actually do the things that need to be done. The content of the leadership is something that is lived, is something that is, is, is demonstrated. And I think we've now come into a point in our world where we actually use, and I don't know, because you spend so much time and I think you are so much better than me in, in really addressing the whole leadership space. I don't know if maybe we've even reached a point where we have eroded uh, the value of what we refer to as a leader. And I'm not saying that we must change the term, but sometimes I just feel that we take it, it's, so, it's such a light thing to call someone a leader without really looking, what is it that they represent? What is it that they are bringing? Is the fact that I got X number of hands supporting me and endorsing me as a leader mean that I will be able to do these things that need to be, uh, must be done in that position? There may be people that no one votes for, but they are much more of a woman than I'll ever be. And being able to recognize those people in our communities, those people that are servant leaders, that are following leaders, are the people that, when put together, make our society to be what we want to be. And understanding also, I think, amongst ourselves that power shifts. There may be time when, as the leader standing in front, you've got the power to make the change. But there are situations where the people with, with the real content and with the real power to create the change are sitting on the other side. Sometimes power shifts to, a, for instance, a constituency in an obscure part of a community that you are serving. And being a leader is also about being able to recognize that and give it support and make sure that you don't kill it, it doesn't threaten you, and that you nurture it because being a leader isn't about the one person standing in front, isn't about the, the one person that people voted for. It's about harnessing all of the energies that we can all bring about. Uh, also, as citizens, we obviously have choices. Choices on how we choose, we guide and we exercise our own leadership. How we guide the people that we choose as leaders, how we hold them accountable, as well as what we do ourselves in order to make the people that we elect successful. Because sometimes we also elect people that we believe in and then we don't support them 
and even if they're very good people, we actually compromise and make compromise them and make their work difficult. So the fact that you've elected someone isn't the end of your job. You have to continue to be part of this collective that is making the leadership to have content and, and, and to be uh, sustainable. So in public, as public representatives in the private sector, in the civil society, and as youth, we each have a critical role to play in making sure that we make, uh, we, we fulfill the plan as it is supposed to be. In private sector, for instance, the fact that we have lived and are still living through the financial crisis that we've seen, it's an amazing indictment of collapse of leadership in that sector. I know also that we share that as government who are regulators, we should also have been able to see that something was so fundamentally wrong in the manner in which we are conducting our affairs. But the fact that it is still difficult for private sector to take responsibility for what has happened in the world, for me, is also something that really worries me about what is it that we've created in the private sector. And I'm hoping in this generation, we're going to have a completely different corporate animals who look at closing a deal, not in terms of how much I have been able to outmaneuver the person I was dealing with, but how much I have been able to win fairly without necessarily destroying the other person. And being able to treat my customers in a manner that is fair, that does not mean that I have a winner-take-it-all attitude, but I actually want an economy and, and commercial citizenry that works for most of the people, my shareholders, my client, and the community in which we make business, something that we felt that we were missing. A friend of mine in India, and uh, I know that I've got very good uh, MBA graduates here, blames that uh, uh, on the culture of the MBA, where winning at some point became so important, uh, making more money became so important that when people were working, especially uh, as investment bankers and, and, and so on, just closing the deal and getting the most of, of it was and, and pleasing the shareholders was much, much more important than am I actually creating a world that will not work for most of the people who are in it? Something to think about. How do we influence? When you go and you become an MBA student, how do you go there with a total fresh outlook about how you'll be the best MBA student who will also make the world better? These two things do not have to be mutually exclusive. Women, I said, was another important uh, constituency uh, in relation to poverty. Not only because they are about uh, half of the world's, po a little bit above, and I, I can't uh, uh, be sure now, there's because there's been statistics that suggest that the, the population of women is decreasing. So I don't know if we still rule as the majority of the citizens. For, for the purpose of this argument, we are the majority. Now, if you shut women out because of gender discrimination from the time when they enter primary education, as it has happened in certain situations and in certain countries, that gender prejudice, a baby becomes prejudices, prejudice as they are born as a woman. You actually script the life of that little person to be a life of disadvantage. It's like Fervud in the apartheid state scripting that black people in South Africa will not have good education, will be poor, will have inadequate housing, et cetera, et cetera, so that as they are born, they must live a life of disadvantage. What we have seen happening to black people in this country, we sometimes do to women, starting from just a baby, a baby girl. And fighting gender prejudices, prejudice is absolutely, absolutely as important as fighting racism, and any other form of discrimination that we can see in our society. Because we sort of take out of the equation of making a world function that functions optimally, we take all of those citizens out of that equation and we give them less possibility for them 
to, to make things happen. But of course, thankfully, it has changed a lot. I know we've got very strong women in this audience. We see it in our society. Over the years, we've seen it getting better and better, but we're not there yet. So in Africa, we've got a lot of work to do back in our villages and in many institutions that you will be leading. If you are a leader, you have got to have a mechanism of evaluating the impact of your policy uh, based on whether they work for women in your institution. Because you can have a, per a perfectly neutral policy in your institution that is not meant to discriminate against anybody. But guess what? It, by the time it is implemented, it will work differently for men and women. And without having designed the policy to discriminate, it will just discriminate. In um, situations uh, where people, men and women, doing exactly the same work, just get unequal pay. It's still happening in this country, not in the public sector in the main, but we see it in the private sector. It is happening even in the developed world. Now, these institutions are led by great men and women who I don't think that are necessarily sitting somewhere in the corner planning to discriminate against anybody. But not paying attention to detail and making sure that you engineer processes in your company and in institution in such a way that there's equity and fairness. It just, this, these things actually do happen to women. The UN has also, UNDP uh, had statistics that showed that uh, the women did two thirds of the world's work. Whatever we qualify as work, both formal and informal, in home and out of home. When we put together all of the work and the bulk of the work that is done by women is the work done at home, which is unpaid and therefore uncelebrated and unrealized. Because if you think about the women who stay at home bringing up children that do not expect uh, to be paid, if you were to hire someone to do the job and you quantify that, it gives you the contribution that the women are, are making to the GDP in order to enable maybe the men to go to work. Women who work in the fields, in agriculture, in many of the countries, and therefore provide food and, and, and earn wages that uh, we all will be ashamed uh, of. So all put together, uh, equal to two thirds of the world's work according to the UNDP. And they own one eighth, one eighth of the world's wealth. wealth. So do two thirds of the world's work and you, you, you have one-eighth of the world's wealth. And women have the highest impact in decreasing poverty, especially when they are educated. That is why we, will, we say you educate a woman, you educate an, a nation, because of their ability to use whatever skills that they have immediately to make the lives of their children better. If a woman is educated, Children will drink a formula, the formula milk will be mixed in such a way that will be healthy for the child. So immediately you've addressed something that could just be a, cri a health crisis for the child. They will take the children for immunization. They will not have so many babies, et cetera, et cetera. So immediately you change the game for that country and for that uh, uh, community. And of course, you begin to address intergenerational poverty because then they can pass, in, pass on a better quality of life to their, to their children. You also, I think uh, my favorite example is that when we go to the courts uh, in many countries where uh, we deal with maintenance cases, you hardly uh, are ever in a court where the person who's accused of not supporting and maintaining their child is a woman. Whatever they have, they will spend it on their children first. And that is why investing in, in women is an important e e economic investment for the country because you've already uh, made an investment for someone who will take care of the next generation and usually also women take care of the old people in a society. Again, another responsibility that the public institutions would otherwise have. One can go on and one day you should play a Chris 
the 24 hour of a man and a woman game with the team here and just walk through. That for me always, when I was young, it was the best uh, education about gender discrimination that I've ever had. We don't have time to, to play that game today. So leadership, women, education, and I'm sure there are many other things, but for me, those really stand out. And I'm sure you could turn around these variables whichever way you could find other way of explaining what I'm trying to explain and their importance in the fight against poverty. So together, as this august body and audience, we have got to be concerned about fixing education. And when we receive it, we've got to interact it in such a manner that we embrace it and we use it in the best possible way. As young people, we have got to be concerned about being leaders, and here I'm talking, I'm preaching to the converted, but also we've got to be concerned about the content and the quality of our leadership. We must be able to recognize the leadership, not just in ourselves who may stand in front, but the leadership in the people who are all around us, including those people that follow, because they provide a particular type of leadership as, as followers. And honesty and integrity and humility are something that as a leader you must always embrace. We also have to make sure that we do not tolerate any form of discrimination. We don't tolerate gender discrimination. We don't tolerate xenophobia. We don't tolerate racism. We also don't to tolerate oppression that is class-based and discrimination that is class-based. I thank you.